have two questions, more for information. Uh, uh, one thing, uh, uh, you might know the research of Jan Asman in Germany about memory and writing. It would be interesting to know how this, what you were saying in your fascinating paper, how this relates to this research. To what extent uh, do religious traditions need a kind of uh, writing tradition in order to develop institutions and canonization and this kind of uh, stuff? And the second question relates to that. Uh, as you touched on that, how reliable are compared with that oral traditions? Um, Asman is you know, better than I is working, working from an Egyptian base onwards. And um, I think his work is one of those that, that shows how important writing is early on. I don't think it's the only way you can memorialize things. Um, I think it's a powerful way of, of, of encoding certain kinds of information, like cosmological information. But information about how to perform rituals, not necessarily. Um, there used to be a custom in the UK of beating the bounds. Do people know about this? Where you beating the bounds, where you would take children around a parish, and you would beat them either really hard or just symbolically. Um, and the idea is that eventually they would know where the end of their parish was and where the beginning of the next parish was. Um, and I, I've seen this being done symbolically in the city of London. I mean, not very recently. I expect it would be all over the Daily Mail if it were. Um, I did it every year in my village. <laughs> did you? Right. Oh, oh, well, that's good, yes. So, I mean, from that point, so there's other ways of, of creating a memory culture which are not to do with writing. But my guess is that it would be that certain kinds of knowledge are more conveniently stored in writing than others. You've given us an insight into a great variety, uh, I mean, you've pointed it out yourself, a great variety of ways in which writing functions. And they're, they're very different in many ways. You I mean, you get the, 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 gr the elite group of a dozen priests in their grove, highly exclusive, highly elite, highly literary uh, group of people. Yes. Um, I, I keep coming back to Paul and his early churches, which is a bit boring of me, but that's what I, that's what I think about. Um, I don't get the sense, maybe I'm wrong, I don't get the sense that ordinary plebs, ordinary folk going along to ritual settings in Roman polis um, were required to engage in texts particularly, by and large. Would that be right? I think they weren't expected to sit down and read them and that you could be a participant in a most ancient religious ritual without much knowledge of the spoken of the written word. Um, so in that sense, I think I agree with you. But as you said in your introduction to me, um, We've, we've by and large moved away from trying to simply put a quantifier on. But I mean, partly because it's so different than what literacy constitutes. You know, what is the, the cutoff? What's the threshold? I mean, what makes somebody literate or not? And if, if one were to take the idea that being literate means having the skills to make sense of the signs you need for what you're doing, then in that sense, maybe very many more people were, were able to operate. Maybe they were able to make a certain amount of sense of of graveyards and votive altars, and knew who to ask when they wanted other things, and in the way that uh, most of us occasionally rec have recourse to our IT department or to accountants to help us with graphic symbol systems which we feel deeply um, unhappy at, at, at understanding. And our society as a whole works. We don't sort of stigmatise people for not being able to read Excel spreadsheets. Um, well, <laughs> some of you are embarrassed about it, but... <laughs> But uh, you know, collectively, we're able to use them as a society. I think collectively, ancient societies are able to do more because they've got these texts around. Um, so from that, so uh, it's going to sound a terrible academically wriggle to say it depends what you mean by literacy. But it really does depend what you mean by literacy. It's, it is only, when Harris was doing his initial work, he found a small number of exceptions to the general rule that literacy was rarely above about 20% of adults, males, um, before the 19th century. And these exceptions were largely Lutheran communities, where certainly because such a huge emphasis we put in the early modern period on being able to read out a small... Now, 
Do you read the same things all the time? Is it like um, Oscar Wilde's famous entrance exam? You know this story of his entrance exam to Oxford where he's given a passage of the New Testament to see if he reads Greek well enough. And he's given the trial of Christ to translate. I can't remember which gospel. And after a few lines, um, his admissions tutor says, that's fine. And he says, do let me carry on. I want to know what happens next. <laughs> So, so I started to imagine these Lutheran communities of, of high literates, you know, reading the Lord's Prayer again and again and again and, um, and occasionally blurbing over little bits of it. When we read Paul's letters, uh, particularly in Romans, the two Corinthian letters and Galatians, but in some of the other ones as well, we see a, a fantastically learned discourse going on where he's referring to these Jewish scriptures largely in Greek. Um, in, in very subtle ways, and he's weaving it into what he's trying to tell them, and he's often trying to argue out a difficult position in, in the face of some hostility. And I think perhaps in, <coughs> particularly in Protestant, uh, in Protestant circles, we imagine that when we read Paul's letter, that is what, like the, uh, that, that is what the early church was like. It was like reading Paul's letter. And everyone was studying and learning and reading and quoting. And, and if you quote a bit of Isaiah, then you imply the whole chapter. And if you quote a bit of Deuteronomy 30, then you uh, imply all of Deuteronomy 30. And, um, and in fact, it's Paul doing a very particular thing. He's writing a letter um, and he's trying to persuade people, perhaps certain people. Perhaps Christian worship was nothing like it is early Christian worship in the 50s or 60s of the first century, it was nothing like our literate experience of reading one of Paul's letters and perhaps yeah. knowing extracts of things, perhaps having little lists of extracted testimonia from the prophets was something that people were working with to some extent. Um, yeah, so I, mean, I, th I, th I, th I think little fragments of text, that this occurs constantly in classical writing, that you have people who know the odd phrase of Virgil or, or occasionally people seem to be summarising from books of summaries and they don't know how the whole fits together. And yeah, my example of, of graffiti from the first book of the Aeneid uh, would go along with that, um, or, or our own habit of quoting bits of Shakespeare without necessarily having read the, or remembering the whole of the play that's in there. So that makes perfect sense to me. I mean, this is very much your patch, not mine. It's a very long time since I've read much Paul, to be perfectly honest. But my, my memory is that the letters are also about practice. They're also about, yeah, what about girls? You know, can we eat pork? All those sort of things, you know. Uh, yeah. Someone died. Was that meant to happen? <laughs> and so there seem to be a lot of other concerns being addressed. And, and obviously, obviously there's a highly learned um, level and... Who's he arguing with? Who are the anti pauls Who are the opposite numbers who he, who he needs to ramp up like this in order so that other people don't say, yeah, but I don't know about what Paul says because if you remember back in whatever. I mean, I, yeah, I, I, is this a conversation? I mean, one of my... Um, one of my graduate tutors, I'm doctoral supervisors, uh, was Keith Hopkins, who wrote a very provocative essay called Early Christian Number, which some of you may know in the Journal of Early Christian Studies. And what Hopkins does, he's, he was a trained sociologist, and it's in some ways a bit like Rodney Stark, but with more jokes. Uh, and he says, well, let's assume that the numbers of Christians at the time of Constantine are more or less as Harnack and so on thought. And let's assume there are no Christians in the year zero. And let's, because I'm a socialist, let's just draw an exponential growth line up between the two. And if, if you draw an exponential growth from zero up to high next totals, what you find out is that, do you know, we'll know this article back already, that, that there are almost no Christians for a long period. And this, is, for Hopkins, is a good explanation of why Christians think they're growing like crazy and nobody else mentions them more or less until the early second century. Um, and it also, so, it, you know, what Hopkins also deduces is that most Christians for the first two centuries are converts. That, that there is our Christian families, but almost everybody who's a Christian wasn't, wasn't brought up in that tradition. So you've got a constant process of acculturation. And then he does also ask the literacy question. He says, well, yeah, if it's true that there's only a few, yeah, a few hundred Christians in the year, in the year 
60. And if it's true that only 10%, 20% of the population can read and write, yeah, how, many are, how many potential correspondents are there for Paul? You know, we're not looking at something like the word of Augustine with uh, collect, you know, bishops' councils and you know, people studying, catechumens and all the rest of it. We're looking at a, at a highly dispersed world of people, maybe a few dozen, really, who could read and write. So I'm, I'm very puzzled about the missing apostles. Who, who are the people who, who don't end up in our New Testament canon, but whose, whose alternative views to Paul are implied by the care and erudition with which he makes his own? And, and I, I, who knows what's going on there? But um, I, mean, I, I, I think I agree with you that early Christianity can't have been... It can't have been like Brian Stott's textual communities. It can't have been groups of super literate people going through text with almost rabbinical care, you know, copying them, discussing them, writing commentaries on them, you know, masters of, ex of exegetical practice. It must have been very different from that. But equally, uh, you know, th there's, there's a lot of stuff about early Christianity which is just about, you know, can I eat with my Jewish neighbour? Yeah. Yeah, what, yeah. What, what do we carry through, what do we not? There are letters in which Paul just doesn't quote scripture explicitly, yeah. although we see it woven in there in terms of sort of subtle reference. Yeah. And so, I mean, I'm, I'm happy with the idea that Paul wrote much of what he wrote to be understood by someone without expertise. But his, his own appeal to Isaiah and Genesis and Deuteronomy <coughs> And the Psalms is important to him, and it goes on underneath. And so, he he writes on two levels, really: one for yeah. himself, uh, and one for the lowest common denominator. And one of the other things I did as a, as a jobbing my role as a jobbing cultural historian is I did actually do a bit of work on epistolography, particularly Pliny's letters and so on. And there's a there's a distinction that classicists use quite um, easily between letters which are which are sort of open. They you they they're highly. The, Almost anybody can understand. You don't really need notes to follow. And something like Pliny's letters, um, or Paul's letters, we're coming to this category. You just pick one up, and it makes sort of sense. And there's other ones, like Cicero's letters, where you've no idea what's going on. It's constantly referring to knowledge shared between the correspondence, but outside the text. And so Paul's letters do seem to me to be sort of... Um, they, they, they seem to be designed for why... I mean, these are the versions we've got. It's definitely not Finnegan's way. He's taken the age of Diocletian and Ebola in terms of doing the same analysis as the Um I think I think Christopher Kelly's work is really interesting, and he's um, uh, he was in fact in the book that Alan and I edited, and um, he's made very effective use of of Roman law and the documents generated by petitions in Roman Egypt, but also uh, the kind of account, uh, reconstruct a kind of bureaucratic ideology from late antiquity. My guess is that, is that that's not so true of the early empire as the late empire, uh, but that when it becomes true of the late empire, it's also true of the Sasanian empire, and it must increasingly be true of bishops' courts. And as bishops come to in a, in a yet a later period of antiquity to uh, to do justice and to advise in courts and to have people around them and to patronise um, scholars and so on in some of the ways that early Roman aristocrats would have done, then much the same might apply to them. So in terms of literacy and theory, I mean, how deeply have because he might not have touched on it. He might be worth thinking about the age of Diocletian. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, the age of Diocletian... Yeah, the age of Diocletian is... I mean, it's, it's an age in which people are fighting to get hold of and destroy each other's sacred texts in the Great Persecution. It's an age where the imperial government is trying to recruit more and more educated people from the towns because they're growing a bureaucracy and they've nowhere else to get people from this. So 
we're we're still a hundred years or so before Augustine's time, but in Augustine's time, he's there's clearly a network of local schools and town councillors send their kids to school and hope that if they study well enough, they'll go on and study further and enter the imperial bureaucracy, which is where the big rewards are. And we have all those amazing stories, not just Augustine at um, Carthage, but um, uh, you know, Gre uh, Libanius at Athens and, and, and Gregory. Um, and that's the end, just talking about a, a world that is sort of has something like recognisable higher education in it and sort of gangs of students fighting in the streets over which their professors is smartest and things like that. And Augustine take a quiet government job in Rome because he can't stand <laughs> the chalk face anymore in Carthage. So, but, so I, I, I do think things are changing from that late antique position on, but... Um, I mean, in terms of... Because the Hopkins approach is very much has became very obsessed with Gnosticism, and Gnosticism is almost a very untangible religion. So Hopkins is somebody who really tried to grapple with that kind of thing. Whereas the Kelly approach is much more bureaucratic and they're, they're, they're similar, but yet yeah, diverse. I think it does. Yeah. I'm sorry, I think it does seem more bureaucratic. Um, part of the problem is that bureaucratic societies generate more texts. And so we see them with a bit more clarity. And one could imagine an early Roman world in which maybe some of the same skills of reading and writing were quite widely distributed in the cities of the empire, but they're not yet generating the kind of things that end up in the Justinianic code and so on. The, the text that I'm aware of, which I've always found really fascinating, is this... Um this rule code from the Andanian Mysteries of Messiana. I don't know that one, no. It's, it, it lists this ritual that they do once a year. They set up a holy boundary. All the local um, traders come to the outer circle and trade, and they even divert municipal water source for a week. Oh, right. But the holy men and women parade in their holy gowns with the patron who's named at the head of this... Um, of this sort of procession. They go into the inner area, which is holy, in the grove, yeah. and they perform a week worth of mysteries. And, the, and the, there's all sorts of, you know, the, 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 the holy maids will sing various things, and the holy women will do things, and the holy men will do things. And, um, and finally, it sort of says, and, and, and the men and the women are, <laughs> um, they're sort of, what they're, they're, they're sternly charged not to do anything in inappropriate in the frenzy at the end of the, of, the, <laughs> of the ritual, at the end of the week, which suggests that they might have got a bit frisky in some way, especially husbands and wives, no, no sort of messing around. Um, and it mentions this procession of, they carry this box with the holy writings in. Yeah. And I just wonder if you've got any sense from any other sources or, 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 or evidence of what role a holy text might play in a, in a ritual setting? Almost not. I mean, I don't know the inscription you mention or when it's from, but the apart from those Orphic tablets, which are certainly not for widespread consumption in public religion, I think holy texts, texts of sacred objects are quite... I, I, I can't think of examples before the sort of Jewish... Innovation. I mean, I can, you know, people carry other things, but yeah, it's not really a world with relics either. I mean, you carry statues of the gods. Sometimes you carry statues of the gods as if they're real people, and you put them around the banquet and have a meal with them, and then you take them back when they've had enough to eat, or you dress them up in new clothes. There's lots of manipulating statues. Um, and in triumphs, people will carry booty, and occasionally there'll be labels saying, yeah, this is, this is from Jerusalem, this is from Caesarea, or whatever. Um, but... But actual texts that are themselves regard as sacred, I can't think of examples. There's no reference yeah. to reading it or doing anything with it, so it's, um, there does seem to be something different about yeah. Jewish and early Christian. Uh, yes, I think it's a, it is a different... And maybe Egyptian as well, things like the Book of Thoth. I mean, maybe... OK, oh. oh.